need to in, uh, to introduce you, Maria, because we always talk about you as a student, and they they know your poetry. We've read a couple of poetry in the class, so they 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 are very excited to meet. And um, I thank you very much for being with us today. Because you know, I know you had some health problems, a couple of surgeries, and I'm so looking so energetic, so great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita. It, it, I remember my time in Calabria as a wonderful time. What a beautiful place! What an amazing place it is, and all sorts of different landscapes, and the people are so welcoming and warm. I just loved it, every minute of it. It's a very fond memory, and it got me through some very dark times this spring, thinking about that. Yeah, that, uh, we are all very happy. I'm sure all the students are happy. I see a couple of other guests are here. Very welcome. I see Dina. Ciao, Dina. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. It's lovely to see you, too. And I saw Anna Clara. OK. Dina Eloise participated in the writing seminar, the Italian Diaspora Studies Writing Seminar, Heritage and Memory that we offered in May 2019. And I hope uh, Maria would like to say something about this later on. I will. So I suggest that you start so that after when you finish, we start with questions. I know the students are ready to. I'm looking forward. Okay. I, I, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what it was like to grow up as an Italian in America. I have to say that because my parents spoke Italian at home, at the home um, it was an Italian dialect, but I didn't understand that at the time. I thought I was an Italian. I was convinced that I was Italian and that if I went to Italy, they would recognize me immediately as another Italian. Then in 1978, my husband and I went to Italy for the first time. And I realized that the Italians thought of me as Americana. But since then, I've written probably thousands of poems about growing up Italian in America. And a lot of my poems have been translated into Italian. So each time I go back, and I've gone back many, many times, I feel more and more a part of Italy. and more and more as though I can really claim myself as an, an Italian, sort of a bridge between Italian and American. Um, I never felt foot, fully American because in America, if you weren't somebody who came up on over on the Mayflower and were a long residence of, resident of America, you probably weren't considered to be American. And there were many ways that people let you know that you weren't quite right, that you were a child of immigrants, that you did not speak English when you went to school. Uh, there was always that struggle between loving Italy and loving Italian and the way the Italian language sounded to me. And maybe people from Northern Italy would laugh because it's a dialect. But I love that sound of the language and the way my parents spoke it. I love the music of it. And I think in many ways, Italian has influenced the way I write my own poetry. I came in grammar school after I learned English to love the way English sounded when the teachers read it and read poems out loud to us in English. It was a wonderful experience for me to hear the sound of English in the mouths of people who were educated. My parents could only speak a broken English, sort of like the Italian I speak now, half English, half dialect, half standard Italian, and I never know which one I'm putting together. And that's the kind of um, relationship my parents had with English. They never quite, my, son, my father said, I can't get my tongue around English, but he could read in English very well. And he, was, he would go to different Italian societies. At one point, there were 50 different Italian societies from people from different regions of Italy that were formed in Patterson because these new immigrants were scared. 
they didn't feel particularly welcome to, in America. Uh, they felt they had low level jobs. Uh, they were not doctors coming here to America as they very often are now, but they were people who ended up working in factories, leaving, leading a very marginal existence in America. So they never really felt welcome. So they'd start, uh, my father was a member of the Chilantana Society of, of Patterson, and it became a mutual benefit society. So they had a death benefit. They'd help us each other out. They've had feasts. Um, they, my father had a bocce court built at the society headquarters. It was uh, a place where they could feel at home with ugly other people from their region. When they moved to Patterson, they moved into a neighborhood that had a lot of people from Chilento. It also had a lot of people from Calabria, from Sicily, but it was definitely a poor area. So it didn't have that many people from upper class northern um, Italy, but it had a lot of people from southern Italy. And many of those people, like my parents, came to America not because they wanted to leave their beautiful country or their beautiful language. They came to America because there was no opportunity for them in Italy. There was no ability to have their children lead better lives than they had. So they left their parents, they left their grandparents, they left the country they loved. And they came to a country that was kind of hostile. I have to say, I love America, it's my country, but they did not treat the immigrants very well. And right now, they're not treating immigrants very well either. And it makes me very sad when I see Italian Americans mistreating immigrants because we were the immigrants. We were the ones that they said, my father once walked all the way from Hawthorne, New Jersey to Passaic, which is a long walk. And he followed the railroad tracks to say, because he heard there was a track, there was a job that was available in Passaic. And he didn't want to spend the five cents on the train. So he walked along the track and he got to Passaic and they yelled at him, get out of here. We don't want your kind here. And he had to walk all the way home again on the tracks without a job. Uh, and that was the experience of many Italian Americans. I made it my mission in life to try to recreate what it was like to grow up Italian American in America and what it was like to go back to Italy and to find the people who are my first cousins whom I'd never met before. Um, in a way, my poetry is sort of an extended memoir of growing up Italian in America. So I don't hedge my bets. I, I try to tell the truth as clearly as I can in my poetry. I try to use very direct language, very clear, simple language. In the beginning, because I was in a PhD program in English, I thought I had to write like an English romantic poet. When I went to England for the first time, I realized the English romantic poets are really very wealthy people. And they had nothing to do with me but when I was in a graduate student school, back after my children started to grow up, one of my graduate school professors said in, about my first book, you know, it's in this poem about your father. Can you find the story you have to tell? And I've spent the rest of my life trying to find the story I have to tell and encouraging my students to find the story they have to tell because I think that that's what we have to learn as writers, that we have to depend on the truth of our own lives, that we have to be willing to tell the truth, no matter humili how humiliating it is, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us feel. We need to not lie in a poem and not pretend to be something we aren't. So it took me a while to learn how to do that. And it was that graduate school professor saying, in this poem, you find the story you have to tell a poem I had written about my father that really changed the way I wrote. And I've gotten braver and braver as I've gotten older and as I've written more poems in my willingness to tell the truth, even when it's humiliating, even when it's embarrassing. Uh, my mother, when my first book came out, was horrified. She wanted to write me to write uh, poems about being wealthy. And I said, Mom, I don't know anything about being wealthy. And she said, 
Well, it's embarrassing. You're telling about us being poor and not having food. And I said, well, was that the way we grew up? Or was, was it a wealthy house? She said, I don't care. I want you to write poems like the kinds of poems that are on the backs of mass cards. Do you know what those poems are? They're usually about flowers or they're very sentimental. And But then my mother gradually came to understand uh, what I was trying to do in my poems. But for a while, she was horrified. She said to me, don't write about me. I don't want you to write any poems about me because I don't want anybody to know anything about me. She was very private. I have to read you, read you a poem, though, about my mother uh, because it's really a tribute to her and how I just didn't understand in the beginning. And the poem is called Litter General. It's in my book, The Place I Call Home. My brother called our mother the little general when we were teenagers, my brother driving the car, my mother sitting next to him, her head a small dark knob, barely reaching the top of the seat. My bossy mother who told us how to live our lives, mother who was always moving. When I remember her, I see her almost as a blur, like the cartoon of the roadrunner. My mother who washed all the dishes as soon as the last bite of food finished from the plate. My mother held my doctor brother's my bro doctor brother's foot until he fell asleep when he was still a boy. My mother who sat at the kitchen table with us, always ready to hear the stories of our lives, ready to tell the story of hers. My mother who told me everything that was wrong with me, so I still hear her voice though she said she told me for my own good. My mother who loved the feel of the earth on her hands, who smelled the flour and spices, who baked thousands of loaves of bread, cooked innumerable fragrant meals for her children and grandchildren in her basement kitchen. My mother who taught me how to laugh. My mother who could not read or write, and though she wanted to go to school, my father wouldn't let her. Let her. Women don't need to go to school, he said. My mother, who did not know how much money my father had in the bank and never wrote a check. My mother, who wanted to learn how to do everything. My mother, who could quote poems she memorized in third grade in Italy before she had to leave school. My mother, who drew an imaginary line around us to keep us clothed. The front stoop a boundary, the family country, her little sturdy body, better than any magic charm. My mother, whose skin turned orange before she died, the week she, before she got sick, she planted a huge garden. We were sure she was too powerful to die. Ma, even now, 25 years after the funeral procession, led us to Calvary Cemetery and to the mausoleum door they filed you in. I wish I could drive over to your house and find you, your earthy humor, your warm arms, you always were the place. I call home. It's been a long time to appreciate how hard it was for my mother to leave her mother when she was 23 years old and never see her again. I can't imagine not being able to see my own children. I can't imagine how difficult that had to be for these people coming to a country that was not particularly welcoming except for their labor. They thought of them as having very strong backs and being willing to work very hard at menial jobs. And so that they were needed, but they in some ways were not wanted. I don't know if those are the kinds of stories you've heard from the relatives you have who went to America. I know there were a lot of people from Calabria in my neighborhood when I was growing up. And they very similar experiences to ours the Chilantanos people who were there. Um, they understood so much about what it was like to struggle to try to get ahead. And many people did get ahead. My father came to America with about 15 cents in his pocket. That's very little money. And he worked very hard his whole life. He never had a great deal of money, but he was very smart and he invested well. And he was able to invest his children, is really what he did. And so he made sure that we were able to go to school. My brother became a doctor, my sister a nurse. I'm a professor and a poet. Uh, that was amazing, considering where we came from, the kind of poverty we grew up in, that we could move from that poverty 
from that struggle with the language and trying to learn American ways and American values and never wanting to give up the Italian values my parents taught us. I think back and think, I, I have a lot of graduate students at SUNY Binghamton and a lot of undergraduates who come from wealthy homes. And I see sometimes how lonely their children are, how lo lonely those young people are, how their parents don't really connect with them. And I realize how grateful I have to be for the way that my parents taught us to give back to the world to give more to the world than we were given. My father was always doing things for other people, was always helping other Italians uh, in Patterson, doing their income tax for them, taking them to the consulate in Newark because they were afraid to go by themselves. My father, whose English was a bit small, but his Italian was very good. He uh, taught Italian to young men who were going to Italy to study medicine. And they didn't know any Italian, and he was able to teach them proper Italian. He spoke a dialect to us, but he, he could uh, really speak Italiano, they called it, and proper Italian. Uh, my mother was less able to do that, and she was less educated than my father in Italy. Uh, when she was in third grade, they had to leave school. But my mother was very shrewd and very smart. They both were really, if they had had an opportunity, if their English was better, they could have done amazing things. And when I think of the fact that my brother's children, my, my brother's son went to Princeton, went to Harvard for his PhD, and he teaches at the University of Calabria uh, uh, theoretical chemistry, at uh, University of uh, Chicago theoretical chemistry. Who would expect that from children of immigrants who had nothing to start out with. Uh, my own children, my brother and my son's a lawyer um, and he went to Georgetown Law, which is one of the best law schools in America. Uh, my daughter went to Georgetown as an undergraduate. She has a PhD. Uh, she teaches um, English and media at Bentley University in Boston. Uh, I, I think we all have to be very grateful to what we've been able to accomplish. I also didn't want to sugarcoat how often people made insulting comments to me about being Italian, how the whole myth of the godfather and the mafioso has taken over the American imagination so that people don't feel the least bit of chagrin in calling you. Once I was in Kansas City and my husband had a teaching job at the University of Kansas City, Missouri and University of Missouri at Kansas City. And I had um, these people over to my house for dinner who, was, who were professors at the University of Missouri. And one of them said to me, oh, now that I see the mafioso on the cover of Time Magazine, I see that you're Italian. And he's eating my food. I wanted to pour my lasagna right on his head because he was eating my food and he was saying negative things about Italians. I will punch anybody in the nose who says one negative thing about Italians. I will not allow them to say negative things about Italians. And I've spent a good deal of my life fighting against the kind of stereotypes that are perpetuated in movies in the United States. Um, think about Goodfellow, fellows. Think about the Godfather movies, which are brilliant movies. I'm not saying I'm brilliant movies, but that solidifies the idea that Italians are often crooks and gangsters. And I didn't know any crooks or gangsters. I was, I knew people who work really hard. And those were the people I grew up with. And those are the people I came to admire and to realize that the kinds of values my parents gave me were values that really carried over into everything I've done in my life. Um, I tried to, I love poetry. I came to love poetry when I was about seven years old. I started writing poetry when I was about nine. It was terrible, but I did start writing about when, when I was about nine years old. I started really loving, my mother wouldn't let us off the front porch. She was afraid of America, but she did let me walk to the library, which was kind of far away. And I'd get seven books of poetry or seven books to read for the and then I carry them back home and I'd read those books and then I'd carry them back to the library. 
I also always think that the library gave me my ex education. The library really opened doors for me that couldn't have been opened in any other way. So I love libraries and I love books. I will always love them. Um, but I still say that my mother saved 25 cents a week. I, when my, I had a cousin who Cato came to dinner one Sunday and I, he said, what do you want to do when I was about 17? And I said, I want to be a poet. And he said, that is the most impractical ambition I've ever heard. And so my mother was kind of horrified because how was I going to make a living as a poet? How, how in the world was I supposed to make a living as a poet? So then I said I wanted to be a journalist because at least there was a salary. I never really wanted to be a journalist. I love stories. I love making stuff up. I love remembering and memory and the past. So I really didn't want to write cut and dry newspaper stories, but I wanted instead to write poetry. But my mother saved 25 cents a week so she could buy me a portable Smith Corona typewriter in a pink case so that I could be the writer I said I wanted to be. She wanted me to have that, even though she thought it was insane. Because remember, they had no money. So the thought of, it, it, you don't realize how, um, you don't realize how hard it is to uh, be a poet if you don't have money. You just don't realize it. Anyway, I, I'm babbling on here a lot. So if somebody has a question, they'd like to ask. I'd love to hear it. Um, otherwise, I think I'm going to uh, read a poem uh, about, I think one of my signature poems is Public School Number 18, Patterson, New Jersey. And I'd like to read that to you because I think that it so much signifies my experience in America. Public School Number 18, Patterson, New Jersey. Miss Wilson's eyes, opaque as blue, blue glass, fix on me. We must speak English. We're in America now. I want to say I am American, but the evidence is stacked against me. My mother scrubs my scalp raw, wraps my shining hair and white, white rags to make it curl. Miss Wilson drags me to the window, checks my hair for lice. My face wants to hide. At home, Word, my words smooth and my mouth, I chatter and am proud. In school, I am silent, grope for the right English words, fear the Italian word to sprout from my mouth like a rose, fear the progression of teachers in their sprig dresses, their Anglo-Saxon faces. Without words, they tell me to be ashamed. I am. I deny that booty country even from myself. I want to be still and untouchable as these women who teach me to hate myself. Years later, in a white Kansas City house, the psychology professor tells me I remind him of the mafia leader on the cover of Time magazine. My anger spits venomous from my mouth. I am proud of my mother dressed all in black, proud of my father with his broken tongue. Proud of the laughter and noise of our house. Remember me, ladies, the silent one. I have found my voice, and my rage will blow your house down. So in a way, that poem was my manifesto. That poem was my way to reclaim my Italian heritage and to say I am not ashamed of being Italian. I don't care what you end up saying about me. You cannot say that I am a crook or a criminal to my face, at least. You want to say that behind my back, that's one thing. But don't say it to my face. And uh, I'm sure you've heard stories from your own relatives who struggled when they came to America. I think some of my father's sisters who remained it, only my father and one of his sisters came to America. My mother and one of her brothers came to America. The rest remained behind in Chilento on top of a mountain. Uh, I only met them for the first time when um, San Mauro made me an honorary citizen of the city because of all the poems I've written about uh, that little town on top of a mountain. Um, their lives were hard. When I went to 
get this honorary citizen given citizenship given to me. Um, and I brought my daughter with me. I met all my first cousins and I never met them before. And it was such a strange feeling because I met them and I recognized them. Even though I had never met them, they were like the aunts and uncles I had here, which who were honorary aunts and uncles. They weren't really my aunts and uncles because most of my uncles and aunts had stayed behind in Italy. But when I met them, my cousin Maria, Maria Janine, all of them, I thought these people are so familiar to me and I could talk to them, even though my Italian was dreadful. Um, they understood me. They, they understood my botched Italian. They didn't laugh. And I felt so welcomed by them and so much a recognition of the kind of sacrifices my parents made in leaving these people behind, their generosity of spirit, their love of life, their ability to love food, to make beautiful food, to give away so much. And they had so much in the process of giving away. My mother said, the more you give away, the more you had to give. And I found that in my own life. I've tried to give away poetry. I've tried to encourage young poets, middle-aged poets, old poets to write, write, to come together. I started the Poetry Center at uh, Passaic County Community College in Patterson 40 years ago. And it's we just had the 40th anniversary celebration just before COVID shut us all down. And we must have had 300 people, don't tell the fire marshal, in the building coming from all these different states to celebrate the Poetry Center. And it was such a wonderful feeling to think that this thing, when I started, they said, nobody is going to come for poetry to Patterson. It's a poor city. Nobody's coming there. And I proved them totally wrong. And I love that. I was able to create out of nothing a place for other poets. When my father created a place for the Italians in Patterson, everywhere he went in Patterson, gave them a voice by being um, giving speeches at their Italian societies, the different Italian societies, getting them out to vote, teaching them the power they had as American citizens to make a difference. It was a it was a wonderful experience. Now I've talked enough, I think. Would somebody like to ask me a question about a specific poem or anything? Thank you very much, Maria. It's moving. Thank you for your poems. That was fantastic. While we wait, the students gather their ideas, but a new question. I would like to start with a question for you, if it's possible. Sure. In this this course is um, related to Italian Americana, everyday life today. Uh, we also spoke about um, different aspects of the Italian American communities today in the United States. And I would like to ask you, what do you think about the Columbus issue? Because it was a big thing in the news, you know, the status of Columbus. And the other the other aspects that I, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, if if you can say something on that for the students is that uh, the election, the presidential election and uh, the positionality of at least the larger part of Italian Americans, because when we read from the news, we, we read that many Italian Americans became conservative and supporters of Mr. the current, unfortunately, current President Trump. And I know you are very committed, political committed. This is one of the aspects that's fabulous of your poetry. So can you say something about that? You know, today, Italian Americans in New Jersey today, the politics and also, as also this Columbus big okay. debate. I am a little ashamed of the Italian Americans today because too many of them have become arch conservatives. They become very anti-immigrant. How can they be anti-immigrant? They're children and grandchildren of immigrants, but they're anti-immigrant. As long as it's not them, they don't want anybody else to come in. And I, I feel that's very embarrassing from, for us as Italian Americans. Too many Trump supporters are Italian Americans. Too often I hear them making really negative prejudiced remarks. And I find that very disturbing. On the other hand, I know a lot of young Italian Americans who are very progressive, very liberal, 
very welcoming to immigrants and fought and worked very hard for immigrants. But I think there's a whole generation of Italian Americans that see themselves as protecting themselves against these marauders who are coming in from other countries. Uh, Trump called the immigrants from Mexico um, murderers and rapists. That's just such a horrible thing to have said about people who are simply trying for, to reach a better life for this, themselves and their children, just as the Italians were trying to get a better life for themselves or their children. I know that there's a whole movement against this, and I understand where that comes from, but I cannot give up Columbus. And the reason I can't give him up is because when my father and mother were first in the United States, they had very little to be proud of as Italian Americans and as Italians. And uh, the one thing that they did in school was to teach us about Columbus and what he did. Um, and we learned a jingle about Columbus. And there was a kind of pride in that. And there was so little for them to be proud of in in American society. So in honor of my mother and father, I, I don't really want to give up Columbus. I understand that he brought disease. I understand that maybe he wasn't the nicest guy in the world, but my parents and my father in particular was very political and he loved Columbus. He loved Columbus because he could march in the Columbus Day Parade. It was a big deal for him. It was a time for him to play his tuba and be really proud and be marching with the band and to feel that there was a pride in being an Italian, which the rest of the time people threw spit at him and made negative comments about him and said, why don't you speak English? What's the matter with you? You're not an American. Um, so Columbus became a symbol for me of that. On the other hand, I know that there is a whole group of Italians against Columbus. I, I just can't join it because I feel that it's a it's a betrayal of my father and the way that that was the one thing he could be proud of. I have a poem called Columbus and the Road to Glory about my father marching in a parade and refusing to give up. Although I could hear my mother to stand seen, to stand seen. <laughs> Don't make a spectacle of yourself. I've always made a spectacle of myself. I've always, because when I started out, I was very shy. I didn't speak. And then when I finally wrote, learned to speak up, you can't shut me up now. If you say something I don't like, I'm going to speak up. And that's what, that's what I think we all have to do. We have to speak up against prejudice. We have to say to our relatives, how can you be against immigrants when your own grandfather was an immigrant? Don't you remember that? Don't you remember that your grandfather worked so hard in America? to give you the opportunities to have you now turn up your nose at these new immigrants who are coming in. Anyway, I, I can't be anti-immigrant. I will never be anti-immigrant. I think Trump has done a great disservice to our democracy and has taken a sledgehammer to democratic principles that my father believed in so totally and so completely. He loved America. My mother loved America. I remember once my daughter was the editor-in-chief of the yearbook at Georgetown University, and she took a lot of the pictures that were in that yearbook. And I brought the yearbook home to my mother, and we were sitting with her, and she was looking at the yearbook, and she kept touching the beautiful pages because it's expensive school, and the, the yearbook was gorgeous. And she's going, look at this, look at this. And all these kids who were out of the upper middle class, all their straight teeth and their vitamin in rich skin, and their easy lives. And she said, only in America could we come off that mountain and then my granddaughter go to a school like this with these people and have this kind of life. And it's true, only, I don't know anywhere else in the world where people can make headway that they couldn't make, they couldn't make it in Italy. Although I think a lot of people who stayed behind did fairly well. Um, the the movement from poor to middle class and even upper middle class was possible in America. It used to be possible. It's less possible since all, since all these arch conservatives took power. 
and load the taxes of really rich people. So now middle class people have Thank you very much. Time. Go ahead, honey. Yeah, no. Action today is not very good here because we have a big storm in this area of Calabria. This is okay. So anyway, um, you uh, um, can I start with the questions for the students, Maria? Sure, sure. By all okay. Means. So Daniela first. Daniela Porco. Um, hello. It's hello. A, uh, it is a great honor to meet you. Uh, you have many words and written many books and um, it is a great opportunity for us to have you as our guest so uh, thank you for being here um, well at the end of our course with professor Ganeri and professor Sacco we have to write an essay so my question is about writing uh, which advice can you give us for example writing techniques or also how to organize our speeches in a brilliant way. Mm, okay, one moment. Uh, they have to write a storytelling paper. A storytelling paper. Yes, it's not an essay really because some of them will write essays, but some of them will write about their family history. Yes. yes. Well, if you're writing a family history and you're writing a story basically about what your family was like and which one stayed in Calabria and which ones came to the United States or Australia or some other country, um, then you have to be, what I said before, be really honest, be really direct, be, don't sugarcoat anything. If there was a horrible person in your family, my grandfather, well, I probably shouldn't say that my father's going to turn in his grave, but um, my grandfather deserted my grandmother when she was 24. She had five children. He left her on the top of a mountain in Italy, went to Argentina and started another family and the mother money started to stop coming. Raised her children by herself. And because it was a very um, limited little town, she was, she was alone from the time she was 24 until she died at 92. It was a very hard life. And but that's not the kind of thing people want to hear. They want to hear positive stories about their relatives. But I think you have to include both the positive and the negative. And for me, my grandmother's survival, raising those five kids by herself, um, is a story that gives me courage for what I can do in my life and what my children can do in their life. How you can survive almost anything, even the most terrible disappointments. So I tell you in writing, try to be honest about your what your family was really like. Um, try to be honest about their good points and their bad points. Now, if you're writing an essay that's more of a scholarly essay, I think one of the things you have to make sure is that when you're organizing, you make yourself an outline. So you figure out what your topic sentence is going to be. What's the main idea of your first paragraph going to be? What's the main idea of your second paragraph going to be? What's the third, the main idea of your third paragraph going to be? The main idea of the fourth and the main idea of the fifth. Then in the first paragraph, every line in that paragraph has to refer back to that main idea. And the same thing with the second paragraph. Every line has to refer to that main idea. If you do that, people will be organized. And you might want to just start by jotting things down. Before you start organizing, jot them down things that you want to say, points that you want to make, and then start trying to see what would fit better in the first paragraph, what would fit better in the second paragraph. And that's the way to organize that kind of paper. For writing a story, I'd say just write, just let it come out, whatever has to come out. You can go back later and fix it. Uh, I have a book about writing called Writing Poetry to Save Your Life. And it's how to find the courage to tell your stories. Here it is. And you see this crow on the cover? The crow is the thing that will stop you from telling the truth. The crow will try to keep you from telling the truth. You need to shut the crow up and push him off your shoulder so you can get to that very deep place inside yourself where all our stories are. I call it the cave. It's dark, it's scary, but you have to give yourself permission to go there. 
So you have to give yourself permission to tell the truth. And in the other kind of paper, you have to give yourself the tools to try to make the paper make a lot of sense, which remember that means that every word, every line in the, in the paragraph has to refer, refer back to the main idea. You can't throw anything you want into the paragraph. It has to refer back to the main idea. Daniela, does that help? Yeah. Could you Daniela, hear? Daniela, can you put the camera on? Uh, it doesn't work She's today. Good. I think that for the um, for the storm and uh, I don't know, my connection doesn't work very well today. Uh, okay. So go ahead. Well, that's OK. So what you can do, uh, I know uh, Professor Ganeri is recording this and maybe you'll be able to hear what I said back to you in answering your questions if you're able to access on YouTube or however you access uh, the recording of this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry you weren't able I'm to. I'm sorry hear. for the, the video camera, but uh, today it doesn't work very well. I don't know why. And sometimes when you spoke, uh, my connection uh, didn't work very well. So I'm uh, sorry, Daniela. Thank Maybe you. At some point, thank I can you. Come to Calabria and actually talk to you. <laughs> I'm sure you do a wonderful job on your paper. And, and Daniela is from a lovely, small little town that yeah. resembles Morano that you love. A little bit yes. like Morano, a little bit. Because Daniela, because Maria came to Morano Calabro, Morano Calabro. I know, I know that little little village. I know. I went there. It's beautiful. It's yes. beautiful. And yeah. The whole of Calabria is beautiful in a different way. Each part is beautiful in a different way. I just loved it. It was safe. I will never forget it. And you know, you're really lucky to live in such a such an uns it's really unspoiled in a way. Um, <laughs> we've spoiled a lot of America, unfortunately. I don't want to say that, but we did. Uh, but you don't seem to have spoiled your the place where you live. So that's a wonderful thing. Thank you very much, Daniela. We lost you. Thank you. Oh, you're there. OK, thank you. Annalisa. OK, good evening. Here I am. Um, sorry if I can turn my camera on, but like Daniela said before, I have bad connection too. Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you for being here today with us. Um, I would like to ask you something you said before about the um, Italiano uh, mafioso stereotype, about the common stereotypes and prejudice uh, the um, Italian people lived uh, before. Uh, um, I want to ask you, did you leave these events in first person and how did you overcome these stereotypes? By ignoring them, by, by working really hard and doing everything I needed to do to get where I wanted to be. So I became a full professor of poetry at Binghamton University. Um, I started the Poetry Center in Patterson. I didn't let these stereotypes stop me. They, they were very disheartening when I was a young girl because I didn't know what I could do. But the more confidence I gave, I got in my own ability to do things, the more confidence I got in believing that I could do whatever I wanted to do, I have 23 books of poetry, four anthologies. I've edited a magazine for 40 years. All these things gave me confidence. And so when you have confidence, it doesn't matter what somebody else says to you, but it's still irritating to see the same stereotypes popping up in movies, even movies that were made last year. Um, it's irritating to me, and I'm sure it's irritating to you as well, when they seem to think that, well, I remember, do you, you, anybody watch uh, Inspector Montalbano? Yes, Inspector okay. Montalbano, yes. Yeah, okay, well, um, there's a scene in one of the Inspector Montalbano uh, episodes in which these people from Northern Italy come to Sicily and uh, they have a gun and they think they need a gun to protect themselves against the Sicilians 
who are, they're sure are all mafioso and going to shoot them. And, uh, and they keep making anti-Sicilian comments to Montalbano, who is, of course, Sicilian, and they don't know anything. And they, they are sure they know. And the way these, a lot of these anti-Italian mafia stereotypes are like that. They die very hard. It's very hard to get rid of them. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we have some brilliant filmmakers and directors who are Italian-Americans who've been very successful as filmmakers and directors. And they've, the, the, the Godfather fig films were beautifully produced, beautifully edited, edited. Mario Puzo did a wonderful job on the novel. So unfortunately, because they're very talented, these have taken a deep root in American culture that Italians are all mafiosos. It's not any different now than it was when I was growing up, but I've changed into, I fight the stereotype by being a big, big mouth whenever I can. And I just keep going. I think when any ne negative things come in your way, my mother said, you can't let anything stop you. You just have to keep going forward. If there's a rock in front of you, go around it. Um, you, you didn't really break your leg. Get up. If you're, if you're strong enough in your mind, you'll be able to get up and walk. And you didn't really hurt yourself. And that has served me in very good stead in my life. Um, so anyway, now I forgot the original question. Stereotypes that you, you know, offensive against you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's not like they're not still there. They are still there. People are a little less willing to tell you to your face than they were 50 years ago. But it's evident from the fact that these movies keep getting made in which the, the cooks are all Italian. Now, in point of fact, in America, we have a lot of cooks. And they're not all Italian. There's a Russian mafia. There's a Chinese mafia. There's a lot of, there's an Eastern European mafia. There's all sorts of mafias. But in the minds of Americans, all the mafiosos are Italian. And Southern Italian at that. Not Northern Italian. And I remember once being asked to eat at Yale. And the head of the department was an Italian, uh, an Italian from Italy who came from an upper class home in Italy. And he was horrified by my poems because uh, he came here to get his PhD at Harvard. He had money. Um, he was the head of the department at Yale. Um, and he thought that it was bad to say that Italians were poor, but the Italians I knew were poor and they rose above that poverty. They didn't come here with money. They didn't come here to get a PhD, but he was horrified. Uh, by my poetry, he hated my poetry, and <laughs> read a year, and he came up to me after, and I said, you know, I know you hate my poetry, you don't have to like my poetry, it doesn't matter, I don't like your poetry, which seems to me very elitist, <laughs> so I don't care whether you like my poetry or not, I'm still going to write it, I'm still going around the country and the world reading it, I don't care if you, whether you like it, he was so angry, <laughs> I thought he was going to punch me in the nose. Uh, but anyway, he was, very, he was a very elegant Italian. Yeah. Did Thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I couldn't hear that. Okay. Do you hear me now? Now I hear you. Okay, I want only to um, thank you for your um, personal experience, for sharing with us your personal experiences. And thank you for your wonderful question. Uh, we must seem like people from Mars to you in a way. Do we, <laughs> Americans? Do we seem a little like people from Mars? I mean, it seems to me that Italians have taken this whole pandemic very seriously. And Americans are insisting they're not going to infringe on their free freedom. They won't wear a mask. They won't social distance. The Italians seem much more sensible to me. The government says lockdown, they go in their houses. Uh, yeah. They don't say, I'm not going to wear a mask because I don't feel like it. But in America, that's what they do. And unfortunately, a lot of those people are Italian-Americans, I have to say. Maria, unfortunately, unfortunately, in this second wave of the pandemic, Italians are becoming more and more similar to the Americans, unfortunately. I'm sorry. 
we have no mask movement, no vaccine movement and all these kind of things. And it seems that 80% of the Italians are negazionisti. They mean they deny at least the, you know, the, the seriousness of the disease. So this is crazy. Anyway, uh, they just asked you the question and uh, all the students, many of the students have technical problems today. This is what I was afraid of because of the, this big storm. But anyway, Annalisa has lots of relatives in the United States. And we interviewed in class last week her very, very sympathetic Zia Clementina. You know, it was I love 19, that name. 19 years old that connected with us in the classroom and uh, testified her. His personal history, she emigrated when she already had to. So uh, Annalisa especially is very well aware of uh, the Italian-American, you know, culture and way of life because one large part of her family is there. And we have another student in the course, Paola, who's connected here, but I don't know if she has problems. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're here, Paola. Okay, tell tell her about your mother, that, uh, if you can speak. I don't know if you have a good connection or not. Paola? Yeah, no, I saw the video, but I don't know. I hear you like uh, robotic, so I can try. So, yeah, my mother has uh, parents in the USA, uh, relatives. She's, uh, there is the my grandfather brother there was that is now his dad and um yes he had a beautiful story because he went there when he was like 12 years old he took a boat and he uh, like created an empire because he became a builder and he started with like he started to shine shoes in the station of new york and then he like became a very important builder in Long Island. And my mother, she studied there, but then she returned here because she fell in love with my father. Uh, but she... Uh, oh, that's a lovely story, honey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because my, my mother was like a teacher of English with my father. So uh, they fell in love. Then she decided to stay here uh, and then... Uh, she created her life here, but she we have we have some parents, we some siblings there, yeah. She yeah, well, it's in the it's, and it sounds yeah. like they've done very well. If he's a builder, uh, is yeah. he, um, um, is he arch conservative? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> the you know, I I hate that the Italians when they make it feel that they, they made it so you should be able to make it. So get off of your ass and do it yourself. Uh, don't ask me for any money. That was not my parents' worldview, I have to say. Uh, their worldview is you owe something to the world and you have to give back. And I'm so glad about that because that's been a big motivating force for me. Um, because you have relatives in the United States, you have a little bit of a sense of what life is like in the United States. Yeah. Think, in some ways, we're very spoiled here. We have air conditioning, we have central heat, uh, we have big houses, we have um, lots of amenities. Uh, but I have to say the life in San Mauro is very beautiful. Yeah. Very, it's, all... it's very um, rich in a way that I think we are losing in the United States that kind of richness, the connection of family, uh, the connection to food. I'm not sure that with each new generation, we're getting farther and farther away from that. Our okay. children are scattered. When I live five minutes from my mother and across the street from my sister. My daughter lives in Boston. My son lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. My grandchildren live in Raleigh. My step grandchildren live in Boston. Um, it's very far away. And although I talk to them, I talk to my daughter every day, as my mother talked to me every day, um, it's still not the same as having her right here. And one of the things that I had that was wonderful for me was that 
when we were growing up, we'd stop at my mother's house after school. I would teach and then I'd pick up my children and we'd go to my mother's house and she'd give us a meal, a wonderful meal. She was an exceptional cook. And then we'd go to my house and I'd cook American food for my husband because that's what he wanted. He didn't want the Italian food. And um, I was very lucky that my children saw that, were able to experience that. Um, but the farther away and the older they get, the more of those memories become distant. So I think it's very important for us to be storytellers, to remember that it's something that we save in words and stories, and that that really is, enables us to share our human experience. Yes, I can say that. Uh, my grandmother like brought their Italian tradition because she was born here in Amantea. And I can say that my mother that grew up, grew up, grew up there brought here American tradition. So here we like do Thanksgiving, so Halloween. I, I can say that I grew up in a like Italian American family and I'm so happy about it because I love America. And uh, yeah, it's like tradition is very important for me. So yes. Right. Well, that and that's wonderful that she was able to transplant some of those traditions. My parents did the opposite. They transplanted Italian tra traditions to the United States. Yeah. Your mother transplanted American traditions like Halloween and Thanksgiving yeah. uh, to Italy. I mean, isn't yeah. that wonderful that we're able to do that, that we're able to share cultures and find the good in cultures? I love America. I love, mm -hmm. also love Italy. <laughs> I love America a little bit less since Trump, but I'm hoping that once Biden gets in, I'll start feeling more connected again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Maria, th thank you. Thank you, Jada. Uh, thank you, excuse me, Paula. Maria, yeah. because those, the students here are mostly from Calabria, uh, they all have histories of uh, migration, relatives, cousins, or other people from the families in Canada, United States. Uh, Australia or Argentina. For example, Jada. Jada, can you talk now? Do you have an, a good enough connection? We also met a cousin of Jada. Yes, oh, I'm here. Oh, I yes. have problems, but I can and say on. something about the story of your family. Okay. Hi, and nice oh, you too, you, Maria. <laughs> Hi. Oh, <laughs> what is it bad? Oh, God. Uh, Today, not. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. You don't realize you. you should take a picture of yourself today and in 20 years take it out of the envelope and you'll realize how beautiful you are. <laughs> I always tell my students that because people are very self critical at your age. They think they're ugly. They think they're, and then when you look back, you say, wait a minute, I was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I think because we are home, so. It is a, a sad period, so we are not so happy. <laughs> Maybe for no, this. It's very we're... hard. It's very yeah. hard. It's been very hard here. It's very depressing. I'm a person who needs people. And this has been very difficult to get through. But we're almost through it. I, I want to be an optimist and say in six months, maybe we'll be able to travel again. I'm hoping. Yeah, I hope too. Because uh, last year, at this time, I was preparing my luggage to come to the U.S. So I'm 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 sad for this. I was there in the U.S.A. Uh, which where did you go? Uh, I stayed in Boston and uh, New York because um, I have also a, a story of migration. My my family story is a story of migration, and uh, my mother's relative are in Boston, and my father's relatives are in New York, in, in, the, in Long Island. And we interviewed my, my cousin a couple of weeks ago, that is a CPA that lives in uh, Long Island. And um, yeah, it, it, it was a, a great story also. Uh, that's because Boston is a beautiful city, New York is a beautiful city. Um, it's wonderful that you were able to travel before this happened because yes. COVID, we're not able to go anywhere. So I personally have been in this house since March. 
and it's growing old at this point. <laughs> As I'm growing older, it's growing old being stuck inside. But anyway, so your English is wonderful. All of you have wonderful English. <laughs> um, and that's really a good thing because that means that you're able to go to the United States and understand what people are saying. And and um, would you like, want to go back to visit yeah. the States again? Yes. <laughs> She's uh, yes, um, I'm really, I was really impressed of, um, especially of New York. So uh, I want to, to come back one day. And, I, and I have, I have a question for you. Mm, I want to, to ask you when you're, um, when you started to interest your, um, yeah, your interest about your roots. Okay, uh, I'll say this, that in the beginning when I was first writing, I thought I had to write like the English Romantic Poets. I thought I had to write like a man for one thing and be intellectual and put in a lot of references to Greek gods and all the other things. And then my first book was published and I won prizes for it, but it was terrible because it was an imitation of the English literary tradition about which I knew nothing. Um, a graduate school professor said to me, I was 40 at the time, he said to me, you know, it's in this poem about your father, and you find the story you have to tell. And in a way, that opened a door for me. It made me realize that maybe I could write about being an Italian-American, about being a mother, a wife, a daughter, about growing up in poverty, about the rest of my life and the kinds of things I've done in my life. So that gave me the courage to really focus on my own real story about my life. And I've, I've gotten increasingly more courageous in telling the truth. Uh, my husband got sick um, when he was 45 with Parkinson's disease. And I wrote a lot of poems about that, of what it was like to live with somebody who, um, uh, who suffered a great deal for 25 years with the disease before he died. Um, I wrote a lot of poems about growing up Italian, but I wrote a lot of poems about my children and about what it was like for them to grow up in America and for me to try to get, give them a sense of what the Italian part of us was. Um, it took a long time for me to have the courage to actually drop my desire to think I was upper class when I really wasn't. It was obvious from my accent. It was obvious from my ideas that I was not, that I was actually a kind of um, progressive revolutionary uh, from a lower class home. And, and it took me a long time to admit that. But I think I've gotten braver and braver as I've written. And in each book, I try to be clearer and, and tell the truth more. Yeah, and, and how does class affect your work? How does class affect my work? Um, very much so, I think. Um, I think that I'm always conscious of the fact that I'm not, a, that I was not as a child growing up a middle, middle class person, that I moved into the middle class because of my education, because of the man I married, uh, because of what I've done in my life. But when I started out, I was in the lower class. So it has given me a lot of sympathy struggles of lower class people and f uh, the struggles people have if they don't have money, don't have access to power, don't have access to the language so they can speak up for themselves. So I've always tried to speak up for people who can't speak for themselves. In a way, the project of my poetry is to do that, to give voice to my mother, who was basically illiterate in English, um, who knew Italian, but she only went to third grade in Italy. So she didn't know, like my father knew Alto Italiano, but she did not. And that was such an obstacle to her. And yet she never let her stop her. She never let it stop her. She just kept thinking of new ways to do things. So she was very practical, very down to earth. My father was more of a dreamer and more of a visionary. She was more of a practical, how, how, I, how can I get this done? For example, 
She wants a neighbor who was a mason rebuild his front steps. And she watched him do it. And then she got my father to take her to the hardware store to buy cement and a wheelbarrow and all the other things she needed. And then she got a pickaxe. She knocked our front steps down. And then she rebuilt the front steps. And then when she finished, she said, that was easy. It was like icing a cake. So she was very able to cut through a lot of, a lot of garbage to get to what she wanted to do. Um, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. All right. So thank you. So um, I would like to now see if Elisabetta, Elisabetta. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Elisabetta. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> thank you, Margarita, for granting me this wonderful opportunity. Really, thank you so much. It's really, a so and much. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. So, Maria, uh, you're as usual. You are inspiring, and you inspire generations and generations. So, I'm really, you know, so happy uh, to be in touch with you again. And uh, I just would like to ask you what your plans for the future are. I mean, what are you planning to write? Well, I, I have a book. I have, a, I have another book coming. Like the world needs another book from me. But I, I have a book called When the Stars Were Still Visible, uh, which is coming out from the Samuel F. Alston University Press in Texas in the spring. Um, Wonderful. And it's a book, a book of poems uh, about my heritage, but also about the way we're trying to destroy the world. I'm uh -huh. very upset by climate change, by the kinds of things that we've done that destroy the natural environment of the world. It also has a lot of poems about Calabria in it. Um, it has a lot of poems about Italy and my Italian relatives in Italy. But it's a, in a way, when I was a child, you could still see the stars. You could look up. It was a city, but I didn't know it was a city. I thought it was a country. And you could still look up at the sky and see thousands and thousands of stars. Now, because of pollution, you can't see any stars. And what I saw in Italy was that I look up at the sky, you could still see all those stars. It's not polluted the way American cities are polluted. I mean, I don't know about the big cities um, in Italy, but certainly the little towns have kept a lot of control over pollution. And I think that's a really important thing. So I've been becoming a real warrior for climate change. I've become uh, really interested in um, the connection between Italian and Italy, Italy and, and America, and the connections that I've made in Italy that have nurtured me so much. Um, people like Elisabetta Marino, who's a professor at the University of Rome, have written a lot about my work. Have, That's have me. <laughs> That's Elisabetta right there, looking yeah. <laughs> beautiful as always. Um, and uh, so it's it's wonderful to see that. For me, it's a real, like a, an award for the work I've done, to see people wanting to translate my work. Um, uh, Carla uh, Franciolini, um, a number of other people, have, and Mar uh, Margarita have done translations of my work, have writ written about my work. I love that. I love that Italians are getting to read my work and getting to see how much I love Italy. I love America, but I love Italy too. So I'll always be one half Italian and one half American. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. And talking about oh, your. So you said plans for the future. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've started to paint. Oh, I yeah, yeah. I was a young girl. And uh, then I gave it up because I was so busy getting the poetry center started and raising children and <clears throat> doing what I needed. To. And then about 15 years ago, I was in California with Diane De Prima, who just died, by the way, uh, the wonderful, famous beat poet. And um, we were, became very good friends, although her life was much more risky than mine. Mine was much more conventional, 
than Diane's, but we really found a, a connection and formed a connection. And we were going from San Francisco to read together in Santa Cruz. And we were, she was going to drive me. And we stayed at a, at a hotel in Santa Cruz. And before we left, she said, I'm taking you to the art supply store. And I thought she was going to buy art supplies for herself. She said, no, you're going to buy art supplies for you. And we got to the, we got to the, um, uh, we got to the hotel and she said, okay, you go in your room. I'm going to go in mine and I'm going to paint and you're going to paint. I nearly died of heart failure because I thought, here's this famous poet and she wants me to paint and I haven't painted in 50 years. Uh, but first I kept ripping up things. I thought they weren't good. And then I thought, what, did, what do you always tell your students? It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be your rose, your flower. It has to have the stamp of your personality on it. And that really freed, my, freed me up. And since then, I've painted a lot. I, I've been selling a lot of paintings. I, I can't believe it, but, but I, was, I never had an art course in my life. Uh, but I've, I've visited a lot of museums. I love art. I'm definitely a self-trained artist, but a lot of people have wanted to buy my work. So my paintings are all over the United States now. And I'm always shocked when somebody wants to buy one because I think, but I can't draw a straight line. Um, I do have a web page with my paintings on it. And I, I get people from all over wanting to buy them. It is so heartwarming. And I will continue to paint, continue to write as long as I can hold a pen. Um, I'm still going to continue to travel, although I broke my hip and so uh, my walking isn't so great, but it's much better now than it was even two weeks ago. And I plan to go back on the road again. I began plan to, I, before the COVID hit, I was supposed to read in California. I had to cancel all those readings. Um, I was supposed to read in Detroit. I couldn't go. Um, and so, and I was supposed to read in Italy. So, yeah. I want to do the things I didn't do. I know I'm old, but I'm not willing to give up yet. So I said, you're insane. You're old. I said, I'm not old enough to give up. I'm not giving up. I'm going to go to back to Italy. I'm going to read in Italy again. I'm going to teach in Italy again. And I'm going to teach in the United States again. I have to keep going. And I hope these young people remember that it's up to your head. My mother always yes. said, if you think about it, you'll be able to do it. And she proved that in her life. And I have proved it in my own life. All the people who told me I couldn't do it, I said, oh, to you. I can do it if I decide I'm going to do it. And you can do anything, you young people. Look at all the years you have yet ahead of you. But I hope I have at least some years ahead of you. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. I hope you will come to Italy pretty soon. Thank you. I hope so too. I'm kind of, I was aiming for May, but I don't know. That might be too optimistic, but maybe September. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Am and I the insane fall. to think I'll be able to come in September? I hope so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Thank you. Right. Thank you, honey. Okay, now did I lose everybody? Thank you, thank you. Maria, we have only 10 minutes and unfortunately with this bad connection. So uh, Eloise asked me before, I don't know if she's connected. Eloise, are, are you there? Yes, okay. I'm here. Okay, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so hi, Maria. Hi, honey. Hi. Uh, you're saying about writing whatever you want um <clears throat> without concern sorry <clears throat> so i just finished writing the story about my grandmother my mother's mother and uh, i have two aunties that are still alive um when i showed them the draft they <laughs> asked me to remove uh some information and it was about um uh killing and um just related to a romantic uh, situation and um, they were worried that I would be sued 
Well, did you ever? Yeah. Uh, yes, I did. I, I was never a student, but uh, a student of mine wrote a mm -hmm. uh, book of poems, and in it, she wrote some very negative stories about uh, cousins of hers. And um, it caused a great deal, no, a stepsister sister of hers. And the stepsister was a lawyer, and her husband was a lawyer. And they called the publisher and threatened to sue him. It was a very unflattering picture of this, this stepsister. And the thing about it is that this was this student's perception, perception, and she couldn't really prove what she had said. So the publisher said, I, I'm going to withdraw this book because I can't, I can't prove that this happened the way you said it did, and they're going to sue for libel. Uh, mm -hmm. So he withdrew the book. And she rewrote the book without those scenes in it. I have, I think that you have to be cognizant that if you're writing something that can't be proved, you have to be careful because people can sue you for libel. If you're writing the truth, like nobody can deny that my grandfather deserted my grandmother and started another family in Argentina. They might not like it, but they can't deny it. It was the truth. However, one of my aunts was burned when was kidnapped when she was a little girl. And when she was returned, somebody had sat her on a stove and burned her rear end. When I mentioned this to my cousins, who were her, she was their mother. They said, oh no, she was not burned. Now, I know you can't be burned like that without having scars. So yes, but they didn't want to admit it. So I wouldn't, I put it in my books anyway because I figured they'd never see it. <clears throat> my biggest worry was my mother or my father, if something I said would be offensive to them. Uh, other than that, I don't, I, you know, I figure how many people read poetry? Not that many. And I, I've been pretty clear about my background and my history and the way that our family dynamic played out. I think in general, my, my poems are pretty positive. But if there's something negative that you think somebody can question you on in terms of you can't prove it, then you have to be very careful because they can sue you. So okay. if these people are still alive, you can save that from an, for another book or another story um, because they can keep you. But how old are they? How much longer can they last? You would put it in another book, that's all. If they don't, I don't, not sure that I would show, I don't show my poems to anybody before I publish them, except one yeah. friend whom I trust explicitly yeah. and implicitly. Um, but I don't show them to my relatives because they, they could object. One time I wrote a poem about my brother and his children, and he didn't like it at all. I was getting bad luck. And so I took it out of my, I never published it again. Um, and because I felt I hurt his feelings and I wasn't intending to hurt his feelings. I was just talking about how we can't protect our children. He felt frightened by that. So I thought, why do I have to make him upset? I don't need this poem. I have 20 million poems. I don't need this poem in my book. Uh, so Eloise, Eloise, I would say to you, I wouldn't be showing this stuff to your aunties. Because your aunties are going to upset, object to everything. <laughs> so. Well, they, yeah, they had asked me to write about the northern Italian side of my family. Uh, they couldn't understand why I was always writing about the southern side. So I actually did it for them. And I did change it um, without that piece of information in it. And a few things I, I, I softened. And I actually mailed it to them yesterday, a hard copy. So well, that we'll see how they react. I mean, I think that if, if they're still alive and they were offended and they didn't want that piece of information to come out and be common, common knowledge, then you owe it to them to save it until after they die and can't object. I mean, they won't care when, once they're dead. Right. But they're still living. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you. OK, so now because we really have a few minutes left, but I would like to invite Dina and Connie and Steve and Sam to, to say just a few words before we finish. OK, we'll start first. Connie? Go ahead, Connie. OK, hello, Maria. So really good to hear to hear you again. I didn't see your face. Maybe uh, I don't know if it's a connection, but in any case, uh, hearing your voice uh, is always a treat. And um, I just want to tell everybody that I, I, I met Maria when I got involved with uh, Guernic Editions and we published um, the, the book um, about um, um, writing poetry to save your life. And uh, I was uh, really amazed to hear about second generation Italo-Americans that were still holding to their roots and writing about their roots. And uh, it was great to have that uh, discovery. So happy again to have heard you and hope to see you uh, sometimes uh, in the near future, whether in Italy or here in Canada. Right, I hope so. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm aiming to travel, man. I'm going to put wheels on my feet if I can't do it any other way. <laughs> I admire your enthusiasm and your energy. I wasn't so energetic two weeks ago. I broke my <laughs> hips. So I was not in the great shape, yeah. but I'm recovering. Yeah. Out great. Is important. It's good to see you, Connie. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we will do, we will all organize the presentation of the new book, Celebrating Calabria. Online, okay. of course, yes. we'll do it. Okay, matter to matter for that. Okay, Dina, Dina, Dina. Shalom. Hi. Hello. Hi. Shalom. Where are you, Dina? I'm fine, thank God. And I shalom to my esteemed teachers, Margarita, Maria, Connie. It's wonderful to see you again. And uh, shalom. It was a wonderful time. I'm so glad I went to Italy when when it was still possible last year. Yes. Uh, it was my first time, and I hope it won't be my last time. But it was a good time, and thank you all for... You wrote uh, wonderful things. Did you see uh, the book? Have you seen the book yet? Not not the hard copy, but uh, on online. Uh, the draft that you sent. Right, right. Yeah, really. Beautiful. You wrote beautiful poems, honey. <laughs> Well, if not for your prompting, I would never have written anything. Well, you did it so, though. That's the most important. Yeah, that was the best, the the biggest surprise for me. <laughs> it only that's took seven. What we can hope for is that we get more surprises the older we get. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, and we don't have thanks. a lot. Actually, so how about Sam? Who, who's next? Yes, Sam, Sam frozen and here. Steve. Sam. Oh, yes. Okay. So, Steve, do you want to? Sam is not here. Steve? Hi, Maria. Thank you so much Hi. for coming to our, presenting to our class. It's really inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand that you were teaching the class along with Margarita, or am I right? Uh, yes, co-teaching. Thank, Good. Thanks for her generosity. Wonderful. Oh, thank you to you for your work, for your kind help. And Sam, are yes, you uh, there? Yeah, okay. I sure am. Can you, if you can hear me. Uh, I would just make a, a, a quick uh, observation. I just think we really need to uh, recognize the uh, priority of, of poetry in Italian American studies and art. Of all the things that I've ever read or ever do, it's I've found poetry to be the most uh, emotive, effective, and, uh, and passionate works that I've read. And I think we really need a good uh, anthology that presents many different voices. And I, it would be a great book of poetry. It would be a wonderful tool for teaching, you know, you know uh, Maria's poetry, pa uh, Paula Corso, Joe Bethanti, Ferlinghetti. I r really miss Rose Romano. So I think that would be a, a great text to give a great overview of Italian American history, culture, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good idea uh, to put together such a thing. Uh, the problem always is finding a publisher. They always say Italians don't read. So it makes it very hard. We did do 
Eddie Junta and I and my daughter did a book of Italian American writers from New Jersey. And we did get Rutgers University Press to publish it. Uh, but in general, it's very hard to convince people that the books will sell if they're Italian American and they're not about gangsters. Uh, so I think it would be wonderful to have uh, a, another book of poetry. We had From the Margins, but that's now 1990s. That's a long time ago. Right, yeah. uh, Fred Gardefay and Anthony Tamburi edited that book. And that was wonderful. That was a mixture of poetry and prose. But I agree with you. I think poetry is immediate. It's graspable. We have some wonderful Italian American poets. Um, and Italian, I mean, I think there are probably a number of poets in the Italian diaspora who are writing in English. And so we could put together such a book. I just have to have a little more energy than I have right now to think about <laughs> actually doing that. How about you, Sam? You want to edit it? Well, it would be, it would be interesting. I, uh, this, I think the students respond to it. Uh, it. It's just kind of funny how emotive it is, but it's so accessible, you know. And, uh, well, I mean, gracious, it's quick compared to reading a whole novel, but it's, it gets really touching. So I, I think that uh, it's just a great way to understand the generations that came before us. And, and uh, even, you know, your schoolgirl uh, poems that I've used in uh, when I've taught in, in CLIA. It's just a way for kids to get a real glimpse of what it was like to grow up Italian American, uh, you know, at the time that, that we grew up. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, the thing with poetry is it's compressed. And right. It, and I like poetry that's narrative, that tells a story. Uh, I like poetry that uses clear language. That's not for everybody. Some people write poems that are meant to be obscure. Uh, but I, I, I believe in poetry that tells a story and that is honest and direct and uses clear, easily understood language. So I started throwing away the kinds of things that I was doing in the beginning was to try to prove how smart I was, that I wasn't just this immigrant kid from Paris in New Jersey. <clears throat> and so for me, it, was a, it, it has become increasingly clear that I have to be clear and that my language has to be pared down and that if I can't use a $100 word when the 10 cent word will do. And I, I find that I've reached a lot of people that way. And I get a lot of letters from people all across the world and all across the country from people responding to my poems and responding to my work. Very often people who are not Italian-Americans, but who have come from different ethnic groups and different parts of the country. I'm always amazed when somebody from the top of the mountain in Montana writes to me and feels very connected to my work. I've never been to the top of a mountain in Montana. So that is particularly interesting to me. Very good. Okay, Margarita, did I lose you? Well, well thank we you going? very much. This is uh, wonderful to have you. Thank you so yes, much. We, I, mean, I just I don't know if we have you hear me. The yeah. line is not very good. But anyway, I would like to thank thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita, for all the work you did for the wonderful seminar in Calabria that we had three yeah. years ago. And you hear everything you've done. I, I I really can't tell you how much I appreciate it and and how important it's been to me. Um, so I hope we get a chance to have dinner together again soon. The same with Elisabetta and everybody else. I hope that at one point I'll get to meet these students in person, uh, if possible. Yeah. And I'm sorry that the connection is not great. But if you record it and send me a copy, I would love it. Oh, yes, I will. I will very soon. Maria, thank you very much. It'd be wonderful as always. Thank okay. You, thank you. To thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Thanks, Margarita. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miss you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 B